thank you very much, Jim. It's my pleasure now to invite uh, Christian Porter to his second appearance at the CIS event, the other one was in Perth, to come and address us. And thanks for being here tonight. Well, let me say, first of all, thank you, Jim. That was a wonderful and, dare I say, a dangerous speech, nominating the value of our 1297 copy of the Magna Carta at $21 million. Uh, there's one thing I've learnt in state and federal government, and that is never give Treasury any ideas. Um, <laughs> you might just find soon it's on a 49% lease to some electric corporation. You never know. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening. And Greg and Nick, thank you very much for the invitation. I am here as Parliamentary Secretary to the Prime Minister, so I officially represent him this evening. I do find that when I stand in um, as Parliamentary Secretary for the Prime Minister, um, that the crowd sort of bears this collective forlorn facial expression of young female concert goers who are expecting One Direction and instead get a set from Daryl Braithwaite. So <laughs> I, I hope that you will bear with me this evening. And I might start by... Um, putting to you something said recently by United States Supreme Court Justice Scalia, who said of the Magna Carta, it is with us every day. Uh, in its 800th anniversary year, it is incredibly hard to deny that observation. Indeed, a recent New Yorker article detailed an entire industry that has developed in the lead up to the 800th anniversary. Uh, the Magna Carta now has a Twitter username. Um, exhibitions proliferate, speeches like this do also. The Library of Congress is selling Magna Carta mugs. The National Archives stocks a Magna Carta kids book. Uh, in my own recent trip to the British Library, the gift shop was selling Magna Carta t-shirts, tea towels, inkwells, quills, and even King John pillows. Um, as a member of executive government, I have to say to you that the pillow does not give a restful night's sleep to us uh, members of the executive government. Uh, Jay-Z, the biggest known rap artist in the world, uh, has entitled his latest album Magna Carta. Uh, and I see you, many of you looking blank me. I'll, I'll explain, <laughs> explain Jay-Z in a moment. But tours of Runnymede are doing a roaring trade. Now, whether true or merely apocryphalic anecdote, a story is doing the rounds about a guide at a recent tour who asked for questions. An American tourist asked when the document was signed. The guide said 1215, upon which the wife of the American tourist turned to him and said, see, I told you we shouldn't have stopped for lunch. We just missed it. <laughs> well, you, you try coming up with a Magna Carta joke. It's not that easy. In the actual year 1215, the practical purpose of the Magna Carta was, as we've heard, um, to operate as a political settlement, um, or as some has, have described, excuse me, or as some have described tonight, a peace treaty by stipulating the essential rules for the future conduct of relations between the king and his barons. In this important sense, the document sought to bind the future to the past. And given this essential feature, it is perhaps not unsurprising that in its 800th anniversary, many questions have been posed along the lines of how much the document still actually does or should bind the present. An excellent recent essay by historian Nicholas Vinson quoted uh, the political philosopher John Gray, and I was fortunate enough to have had the philosopher as a lecturer at LSE. In Gray's estimate, the history of ideas obeys only one law, and that is the law of irony. He says, ideas have consequences, but rarely those their authors expect, and never only those. Often they are quite the opposite. The essentially harmless commercialisation of the Magna Carta is one intriguing example of how the past has affected the present 800 years on, in a way that none of the originators of the document would have conceived. I mean, just imagine what King John and his barons would make of a child in 2015 sucking on, and I quote, an original 1215 Magna Carta British Library baby pacifier. <laughs> a plastic dummy with all 3,500 words of the original Latin text inscribed on it. So this evening, I just wanted to simply offer an observation uh, about this notion that the Magna Carta is with us every day. By consideration of both the trivial and perhaps more foundational ways in which this is true. So clearly the Charter is around us every day in a trivial sense through its relentless appropriation for modern causes. Uh, the tea towels, the kids' toys, the dummy are one form of this appropriation, all for a commercial purpose. Uh, 
But to anticipate the conclusion of this speech, I might just state here that the Jay-Z album Magna Carta, interestingly, does not fall neatly into this crass commercial appropriation category, but that's something I'll return to shortly. In any event, I perceive this commercialisation as being largely benign. However, there is another academic or intellectual way in which the Magna Carta is appropriated, which is worth a little more scrutiny. There is a vast continuum, I guess, of political ideas in whose service the Magna Carta has been appropriated over the years. It seems to start at the very broadest level whereby the Magna Carta has been appropriated to advocate on a society-wide scale for whole ideologies, no less, and for entire classes of people. At this grand level, the coarsest of summaries might be to note that the Charter has been adopted by both conservatives and radicals. So the petitions provision has been argued for as a basis for legitimising resistance to the status quo and encouraging protest to authority for groups as disparate as the American Tea Party movement to the anarchists of the Occupy London movement. Alternatively, conservatives have tended to perceive the document as support for the maintenance of stable known structures and procedures of liberal democracy, supporting an institutional status quo. This divergent ideological use is perhaps not unsurprising because in some sense, at least, for the barons, their support for the Charter was both dissent against the unskilled and calamitous exercise of authority of King John, and so it was in that sense radical protestation, but also it was in part an attempt to put things back to where they had been, or at least where the barons, barons perceived things to have been. A place where previous coronation charters that we've had mentioned had established what were viewed as more orderly process-driven relations between the monarch and the baronetcy. This type of grand ideological appropriation is of genuine, I think, academic interest, at least in a historical sense, but also in understanding evolutions in the history of ideas. But beneath the ideological appropriation has been this sort of sectorial appropriation, leading right down to the trend, and a very modern trend, dare I say, of arguing the Charter as the basis for instituting quite specific changes in niche areas of public policy. For this evening's purposes, I will simply call this advocacy appropriation. As a favourite historian of mine, Paul Johnson, once noted, to appeal to Magna Carta became the one great unanswerable argument which any and every section of society could employ. Uh, Johnson went on to describe, archbishops have flourished it against the king in defence of the rights of the church. Edward I flourished it against the pope in defence of the rights of the state. Parliament cited it against the crown and the crown against the parliament. Unleaded peasants used it against their masters, masters against town folk, townsfolk against rural lords. I mean, the uses have been almost endless in a sectorial sense. Then there's this modern habit of arguing that the Magna Carta supports the desirability of very specific um, proposed changes in quite niche areas of public policy. And in my observation, this has gone into something of a hyperdrive in the 800th anniversary of the document itself. I want to provide you with one recent example of this kind of advocacy appropriation to support a specific and niche public policy outcome. And that has been actually with respect to judicial appointments. In what could fairly be described as a call for rather radical reform of common law judiciaries, a member of the English Court of Appeal, Lady Justice Arden, stated a strong preference for a judiciary which is more diverse in terms of gender, ethnicity, and sexual orientation. <clears throat> the link between the desired policy outcome and the Magna Carta was quite clear and direct. In fact, the title of the paper itself was Magna Carta and the Judges Realising the Vision. Selection of judges, it was argued, should be informed by what are described um, by Lady Arden as traditions of the Magna Carta, which would be used to directly address underrepresentation in the modern judiciary. Uh, section 45 was elicited, uh, where it says that justices should be appointed that know the law of the realm and are minded to keep it well. And that was particularly said to require change to be consistent with the vision of the Magna Carta. And the change in turn was expressed as the need, quote, to keep the qualities required of judges under review and up to date, with the new necessary qualities described as, quote, the need for social awareness and the need for knowledge of the case law of courts outside the United Kingdom. Now, this is part of a, an important debate, I think, about um, the role of judges and the limits to the role of judges. And that was a debate which, in my observation, was highlighted quite brilliantly by Lord Sumption in an essay which I'd recommend to you all called The Limits of the Law. 
Lord Sumption recognises that, as we've heard, inevitably judges to some or some more or some less extent necessarily make law in performing their interpretive duty, but equally that process should be rationally limited to avoid what Lord Sumption described as a de democratic deficit. So Lord Sumption outlined a process where an ever-increasing creativity of some courts in the interpretation of written instruments has had the effect of seeing a greater tendency for judicial decisions on what are fundamentally, or at least have traditionally, been economic, social or political questions. Uh, Lord Sumption characterised the Strasbourg Court as having become, and these are his words, the international flag bearer for judge-made fundamental law extending well beyond the text which it is charged with applying. So Lord Sumption takes the view that political or economic questions are not changed into legal questions by their being decided by courts, and that something is perhaps lost when they are moved from the political realm to the judicial realm. Now those that ascribe to, a, to the alternative view to Lord Sumption's, uh, and who would prefer that courts go through more activist interpretive methods, uh, should have a greater role in determining the best outcome in political, economic or social problems. Naturally, uh, they will also argue for selection of judges with more, um, to use Lady Arden's term, social awareness. Now, maybe socially aware judges should increasingly treat written instruments as living trees and should make more socially expansive decisions stretching traditional meanings of the words of the particular living tree in question. I must say, I personally doubt the wisdom of, of this proposition, and particularly if it's taken too far. But it is nevertheless an important, I think, and very meaningful modern debate. And there are very, very persuasive points of view on either side of this debate. But if the argument that more socially aware judges making broader social decisions is worthy of very serious debate, I must confess that I find the idea that the Magna Carta somehow suggests, supports or should inspire one particular outcome over the other as a considerably more trivial argument. Um, and in fact, at worst, it, it presents to me as slightly comic. Um, it's reminiscent in a way of medieval monks poring over obscure scripture, trying to discern the truth of transubstantiation and so solve the, uh, through creative interpretation of age-old scriptures, whether the sacrament is actually Christ's blood or merely a metaphor. I mean, it has at one sense the, almost the nature of looking at runes to detect what we should be doing now in the modern time. And I'm deeply suspicious of that. And I'm not alone, I don't think, in perceiving a kind of near meaningless interpretive stretch in this kind of linking of specific provisions of the Magna Carta to the specifics of presently desired niche policy outcomes. The historian I mentioned earlier, Nicholas Vincent, notes that the problem with this kind of grand interpretive stretch of broad historical words to now support specific modern outcomes is that it cuts both ways. And he notes, and I'll quote again from him, Lady Justice Arden's call, meanwhile, for a judiciary no longer drawn from the establishment, but from the liberal majority, seems to me directly to echo demands in the 17th century that all judges be good Protestants, or in the 18th that judges not only hate the Pope but serve the King. In all instances, what is actually being demanded surreptitiously or openly is discrimination by the executive intended to interfere with the independence of the judiciary. And I think that's a very powerful observation. So like a good lawyer, I've told you what I consider to be um, not profound. <laughs> so what is it that might be more foundational and profound in terms of the way in which the Magna Carta is around us today? Now, perhaps the real difficulty with the shallow commercial or intellectual appropriation for causes of the Magna Carta is that it tends to detract attention from the simpler, more foundational importance of the Magna Carta and so obscure what useful modern lessons might actually be drawn from it in 2015. And as a means of illustrating the foundational point, it is helpful to return to that rap star that I mentioned at the beginning, Jay-Z. Now, Jay-Z announced the title and release of his 12th solo album. I can see that many in this audience perhaps have not purchased that yet, but I <laughs> recommend it to you. And the album was called Magna Carta Holy Grail. And he announced it during game five of the NBA finals. And as part of the promotional deal, he'd arranged for Samsung to buy one million copies of the albums that fans, fans would able, be able to download for free. Now, the Twittersphere went into meltdown over this. You probably missed it, but um, it went into meltdown. 
Um, and the, in the blogosphere, in the Twitter sphere, people were debating why would Jay-Z call his album Magna Carta and call the app that accesses it Magna Carta. And the early preponderance of opinion was that in an industry of rampant egotism, this was simply the next step in what has become known as ego wars. Um, that Jay-Z was saying he was bigger than the two biggest things in history, in effect. Uh, however, this, I think, was a clear misunderstanding. And when you listen to the singer's music itself, it reveals a very deep interest in the rules governing the relationship between the state and the citizen. And probably more people in the world now know about Magna Carta through Jay-Z than they do about lectures such as this, I am sad to say. Um, Indeed, an American law lecturer has designed an entire lecture series around the second verse of Jay-Z's problem nine, song, 99 Problems. Now, I'm not going to rap for you, but um, some of the lyrics of that, of that song go thus. The year is 94 and my trunk is raw, which I understand means that there were drugs in the trunk. And I heard, son, do you know what I'm stopping you for? Because I'm young and I'm black and my hat's real low. Do I look like a mind reader, sir? I don't know. Am I under arrest or should I guess some more? Now, this is a, um, a direct social and legal comment. And at the time, the New Jersey State Police had a very active drug courier profiling program. And here, Jay-Z is offering, I think, a very sharp criticism of the validity of that profiling as a basis for a vehicular stop and its legitim legitimacy uh, contributing to probable cause, or what we would call in our jurisdictions reasonable suspicion, which would be required to justifiably search the trunk of the vehicle. Now, leaving that musical digression aside, I think what it shows is that this is a man with an acute interest in the interface between the state and the citizen, largely it appears born of experience. Um, but rather than egomania, the better explanation for the name of the album was provided when you read around by some very intelligent bloggers, the diarists of today. Uh, one of them said this, he said, come on everyone, it means to rewrite the rules. He says, labels have forever taken liberties over artists and their dealings with releasing works. The Magna Carta, as you hopefully know, was a rewrite of the rules. Jay-Z took this idea and implemented it with his entire roster of artists, hence the internet release and the Samsung deal. So Jay-Z saw his album as rewriting the commercial rules that exist between labour and capital in the music industry. And thankfully, uh, people of a different generation will now have an association, at least, with what the Magna Carta is, and maybe they will want to learn more. But for all of the advocacy appropriations pretending to enlighten us about the importance of the document, which are mostly just pushing someone's pet cause, uh, here is a blog about a rap artist, which in my observation cuts right to the heart of what is fundamental about the Magna Carta and what underpins the profound source and ability of this document to reach 800 years beyond its grave to be all around us today. The Magna Carta was not the first, but likely it is the most historically important rewriting of the rules. So previous charters had been designed to deal with the question of what to do when, in practice, a king was inadequate or downright hopeless, uh, which in the shockingly violent time of the age was usually revealed by military ineptitude, as was the case with King John. 200 years earlier, for instance, King Ethelred was only permitted to return to England on condition that he signed a document promising substantial reforms in his method of governance. So while not the first contract, its historical importance likely turns on the fact that prior to the Magna Carta, a theory of sovereign infallibility likely dominated the substantive practice of politics. In a pre-Magna Carta essay, for instance, Henry II's treasurer wrote, though abundant riches may often come to kings, not by some well-attested rights, but by arbitrary decisions made at their pleasure, yet their deeds must not be discussed or condemned by their inferiors. So arguably the Magna Carta, in my observation, is the pivot point at which the contract theory of the state ends the dominance of the type of thinking elicited by Henry II's treasurer. And the contract theory of the state becomes a replacement paradigm for society's conception of its relationship with sovereign power. Now, the processes and outcomes of the events in Runnymede uncannily mirror three central elements of what modern political philosophers would now call the contract theory of the state. First, 
The relationship between citizen and state should be conducted according to known and knowable rules to which everyone is subject. Second, the rules are a form of fundamental bargain or contract between the citizens and the state to whom citizens have ceded the monopoly power of compulsion, which prior to the creation of the state was in the first instance their own to exercise. And third, the rules can and are to be rewritten from time to time and from issue to issue with the one critical proviso that rewriting must only be the product of agreement in what becomes a never ending process of negotiation, compromise and bargain. The most important point then in my observation is not whether the outcome of negotiations produced a sound blueprint for the good governance of England in 1215 Least of all is the point whether the negotiation produced words that can now provide guidance or clues or inspiration for how we should solve specific modern controversies that are always evolving around the relationship between state and citizen. The power of the Magna Carta to affect and inform the modern is not the result of the 1215 negotiation, but in the fact of the negotiation itself. Now that might sound overly simplistic, but if the Charter's fundamental importance is in constituting a pivot point in the history of ideas, this means that perhaps there is just as much, maybe even more, to be learned by a consideration of how the document came to be, rather than by necessarily what came to be in it. And so I just wanted to offer you a few observations um, about the negotiation process itself that produced the Charter. The actual five days at Runnymede are, by all historical accounts, rather unclear. In fact, the one historical point that is perhaps now very clear is how unclear it must have been to the many participants as to what precisely was going on those five days at Runnymede. There were barons for and against the king, each with intermediaries, both lay and clerical. There were landowners for and against the king. There were church parties for and against the king. And the Pope was represented by his legate who sought to influence all those present, both those for and against the King. Popes have that habit you tend to find in history. Things of great importance to the parties went into the Charter. A whole bunch of minutiae went into the Charter, but equally things of great importance to the parties got left out. The whole point for the Northern Barons after John's disastrous continental forays was a limitation on overseas service clause. Now that was conceded in a preliminary draft, but it was left out of the final document and many of those barons had left the field in disgust before the thing was even signed. Perhaps the overwhelming identifying feature of the process that led to the Magna Carta was that it was a colossal mess. In 2013, a new word entered the Oxford English Dictionary. This word gained popularity in English political circles to describe the general process of modern government in formulating policy. That word was omni-shambles. <laughs> now it's taken us 800 years since Magna Carta to invent the perfect word to describe what happens in the democratic negotiation process designed to produce workable compromise in public policy outcomes, but there it is, omni-shambles. To give you some modern perspective, uh, I would argue likely that the, proceeds, the process at Runnymede was so messy it may have even made Kevin Rudd's 2020 summit look well organised. <laughs> and I'm not having a political dig, I was at Wayne Swan's tax summit and it was the worst two days of my life that I will never get back. <laughs> the historian again, Paul Johnson, argues that so eclectic and failed a compromise was the document itself that had John not got in first to repudiate it, likely the barons would have denounced it in their own turn. And in fact, the document may have become martyred. He described Paul Johnson the result as, quote, a spatchcock compromise, which did not represent the attitudes of any one of the parties, or rather represented bits of all of them, and was therefore unworkable as a political settlement. The story of the Magna Carta, in fact, is not of a negotiation which succeeded, but one that failed. We know that the King repudiates, as we've heard the document, a month after Runnymede, when he realises the barons mean to enforce the security clause. As an aside, uh, in modern politics, we hear a lot of claims of sovereign risk. I hear it all the time. King John's repudiation of the fundamental contract of governance that was negotiated not merely a month before always reminds me of Paul Hogan's great line, that's not a knife, this is a knife. 
I like to think of King John lying his head on his King John pillow, thinking before repudiation, that's not sovereign risk, this is sovereign risk. <laughs> So Magna Carta may have been a negotiation that, failed, negotiation that failed to provide a blueprint for immediate use in 1215, but the negotiation has been an amazing success in providing a blueprint for how to create blueprints. If Runnymede was a bit of an omnishambles, the mess is nevertheless marked by two very serious virtues. First, it actually produces a result something tangible, something readable, something knowable. And again, if you went to the 2020 summit, you'd find out that's not easy. Um, results are very difficult from messy processes. And second, it produces a result capable of evolution. As we've heard, it was rewritten and reissued many times. But always by further negotiation, sometimes the sovereign was strong, sometimes the sovereign was weak. But the rules get rewritten and reissued multiple times by the next generation of, generation of sovereigns by variants of the same messy process. So look, finally, by way of conclusion, and I will warn you that sometimes when I say finally by way of conclusion, I speak for another 40 minutes, but this is not one of those nights. There's another final feature of the negotiation process that I think has its implications for modern governance. As well as being shambolic, the process at Runnymede produces a document which in many respects is actually quite vague. And mostly it's vague about the important stuff. If we, are still, if we were still bartering for Haberject, um, then the Magna Carta's sort of feudal fastidiousness in standardising measures for this hemp-like substance would see us knowing exactly what to do in 2015 when we went to the Haberject market. But uh, if we're looking to the Magna Carta for guidance on the appropriateness of offender profiling as the basis for vehicular searches, or the optimal role for judges and the optimal method for selecting the judiciary, uh, then the Charter is unfortunately much less clear. Recourse to phrases such as that imprisonment will require lawful judgment of his peers or by the law of the land, or that justices should be appointed who know the law of the realm and are minded to keep it, are not in truth terribly helpful in determining what specific rules are agreeably consistent with the concepts of fair conduct in the justice system or the rule of law, which the Magna Carta did indeed inspire. So the messy process of contractual governance leads to government practices and governance documents that tend to be better at getting consensus around weights and measures than consensus around specifics for really important contestable issues. Contractual government seems to be like a very good academic who finds it much easier to get more and more specific about less and less. This is only so because modern governments reflect the features of the people being governed. It reflects that the contract of governance is a messy compromise required to build a political consensus between different interests with different views where everyone ends up dissatisfied to some extent with the end result. A great lesson, as true today as it was 800 years ago, is that a primary feature of contractual government is that we can all agree with a fairly high level of consensus on little things like weights and measures, but equally rational people will very often fail to agree with detail on the precision for the big issues. And so foundational documentary agreement occurs at a very great level of generality and the details of those general principles are the subject of ongoing negotiations and determinations. Issues like judicial roles and offender profiling are contestable, and the way in which we resolve those contested issues will not likely be aided much at all, unfortunately, by recourse to the words of the Magna Carta. But they can be resolved by recourse to an understanding of the processes that underpinned the Magna Carta. To put it to you this way, in closing, a government could certainly choose now to stand for policies that are at least arguably clear in the terms of the Magna Carta. Specific legal protection for the Catholic Church and the aristocracy, tax breaks for the wealthiest, freeing capital cities from regulatory oversight, total freedom of elite immigration, and placing the burden of infrastructure maintenance on local communities instead of government. However, such a political party would be taking Sir Humphrey's words, doing something entirely courageous. But if, but if, as John Gray argues, that ideas have consequences that really reflect what the authors expect, then perhaps one golden exception is the Magna Carta. And this is because 
In a primary sense, its legacy is exactly what was expected by the barons in 1215, that contentious issues could conceivably be resolved, but only after the thrashing out, the debating, the subjecting to argument and relitigation and revision, and even then, the outcome will be imperfect and ongoing in the messy real world of politics. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christian. And it's my pleasure now to invite a senior fellow at CS, Barry Maley, to close. Thank you, Barry. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to, uh, to begin uh, by saying a few words in thanks to National Australia Bank for making this event uh, possible. Um, <laughs> they've uh, been very generous in providing the, uh, the hall and, and, uh, and its facilities, including this microphone, which I've destroyed. <laughs> anyway, let me uh, refer to what we've been told tonight by our two very distinguished speakers, James Spiegelman and uh, Christian Porter. We learned from <coughs> Mr. Spiegelman that Magna Carta has a place in the English Constitution and in the development of the rule of law. And uh, he's given us a panorama of how, <coughs> how, that came apply, uh, how that came about. I mean, it's a remarkable and uh, long story and a very difficult one to summarize in, in two uh, relatively short speeches. But uh, both of our speakers, I think, have succeeded in doing that. But uh, Mr. Spiegelman, <clears throat> I think his main conclusion is that the rule of law is the, uh, the major theme that for him arises out of Magna Carta. And he's shown us in very practical detail and, uh, and in a fascinating way uh, how, that, uh, how that development has uh, occurred and also including something which is very often neglected in discussions of Magna Carta and that's the, uh, the role of the Forest Charter which preceded it. I think Mr Spiegelman finds in the Charter and its history eventually that its major influence has been in the entrenching of the rule of law, especially as a foundation and institutional basis for the expansion of our liberties. In other words, <clears throat> that that, rather than a direct promotion of liberties, is what Magna Carta is primarily about. Christian Porter, <clears throat> took a rather interesting approach too, I thought. Um, yes, well, Christian Porter told us how the United States has taken Magna Carta into its heart in uh, ways that only the Americans can do. Uh, it's typical of Americans that they, with their huge vitality and ingenuity, would find uh, all sorts of uses, including the pacifier, as a characteristic of uh, what Magna Carta might mean. But more seriously, uh, from the point of view of, Mag uh, from, uh, but from a more serious point of view about Magna Carta, he tells us that it's been appropriated as a support for a variety of ideological interests and public policies in uh, some strange ways. And he notes that this can lead in directions that are uh, sometimes undesirable. Um, and that what is fundamental about Magna Carta is primarily its foretelling the end of arbitrary government in favor of negotiation between sovereign government and its citizens, you and me. 
but that this can be a, a rather messy process at times, but the ultimate objective is to, as he put it, to find a blueprint about how to develop a blueprint. So that I would like uh, you to join in thanking them in a moment, but what seems to me to have been uh, characteristic of most of the discussions of Magna Carta is how remarkable it is that a document repudiated 800 years ago, almost before the ink had dried on the document, and a charter never fulfilled by formal statutory enactment, slowly became profoundly influential in the development of the rule of law and the liberties of the English-speaking peoples. Ever since June 1214, the promises and principles of Magna Carta have steadily woven themselves like uh, a sort of golden thread into the fabric of our law. And it's relevant too, uh, in my view, that we should take note that Magna Carta was not exactly an historical accident without a precedent. And that precedent, it seems to me, <clears throat> is to be found in the character of Anglo-Saxon society in the few centuries before 1215. The, by, by the 10th century, England was a fairly united country with a little over a million people. Um, it was in the process of developing the elements of the rule of law, and even in some of its institutions, a kind of representative democracy. Nothing like the sort of democracy we enjoy now, but at least the, the nascence of that form of democracy was to be found there. And uh, I think that that's background to the emergence of, uh, of Magna Carta that uh, is sometimes overlooked. <clears throat> but all in all, we've had uh, a splendid presentation by two very distinguished speakers. And I'd like to ask you to join me in offering them our thanks for what they've done tonight. <laughs> And uh, before we end, uh, I understand that there are some refreshments awaiting us. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for uh, your attendance tonight and in making this uh, occasion such a successful one.